Please join me in welcoming Ben and Evan to the podium to hear about what's going on downtown. Awesome, thank you. Well, I, I just want to start by saying thank you to KPI for having us here to talk. And also, thank you to Art and Sam. I learned some great things from both your presentations, so I appreciate that and appreciate the dialogue that we can have this evening. I was going to share the WSU score, but I uh, stole my thunder already. Um, so a little, a little bit more about me and why I might be here. Uh, so I'm here actually because of roles that I've had in the chamber over the past few years. And so I've been involved in the Wichita Regional Chamber for a number of years. Uh, for a couple of years, I was the chair of quality of place for the chamber. And so it's a discussion we've been having as businesses for a couple of years, uh, talking about how quality of place plays into our ability to attract talent to our region. So something you've already heard this evening. Uh, and then coming up next year, I'll actually be the chair of the chamber. And so uh, you can give me congratulations or condolences uh, for that uh, a little later. But I am uh, CEO of Hutton. Um, I had the great opportunity to take over our family business in 2010. Uh, and at that time, we had about 100 people on our team. Uh, today, we have about 300. And so we have experienced some tremendous growth. Uh, and that growth, yeah, thank you. Um, actually, I brought some of uh, my people who are here with me today, so at least some people will like what I have to say. Um, so, but we, we accomplished that through, uh, I would say, bold planning, uh, being able to assemble an attractive message, and attracting really talented people. Uh, and I think that's the same challenge or the same formula for Wichita over the next few years. Uh, we've seen some pretty scary statistics about what the last 20 years in our city has looked like. Uh, but I don't believe that the past defines us. I believe we get to write the story of our own future. Uh, and we can have discussions about the best way to do that. Uh, but Evan and I are going to talk about one of the ways we think we can do that together as a community tonight. So that brings us to the Riverfront Legacy Master Plan. You know, this is actually uh, an effort that uh, started a while ago. Uh, it is looking specifically at part of the core of our city, right? So bounded by the river and Main Street, Douglas, and Kellogg. Uh, and everybody knows it as really the Century 2 area. And we might call it that this evening. Uh, but we're looking at this and saying, how can we make sure this is an asset that's owned by the city now that is maximized, right? Uh, it's something that we hold as an asset altogether. And we wanna make sure that the return on investment we see as citizens, as a city, as businesses, uh, is the highest that we can get. And so we have been looking at this area for a long time as a community. And in fact, if you go back to 2013, since 2013, there's actually been eight different studies done on different parts of, of this ground or buildings, right? So. We talked about convention, business, and what that looks like, and performing arts, and Century 2, and all of the different components, and there's been lots of studies. Uh, and then we add to that uh, a community development uh, project that um, Evan and I were a part of a couple years ago, Project Wichita, where we talked to 14,000 people across our community and said, what's important for you now, and what do you want to be important in your future? Uh, the number one answer, by the way, in that was they think it's important for us to be able to attack, tr attract talent to our region. Uh, everybody sees that as the most important thing. And so we see uh, this project in the context of that. I see this project in the context of that. Uh, it's about attracting talent to our city so that the statistics we look at 10 years from now when we're together again look drastically different from the last 10 years. So I'll let Evan talk a little bit about uh, how we got to where we are today and where we're going to be and I might throw in a few comments just from a, a business leader's perspective in the community uh, and then we're happy to take questions later so and I'm sure there'll be some great ones. It's always exciting when Ben says earlier today well, let me just be your color commentator and uh, and you go ahead with the presentation. I'll jump in with different quips. And so, uh, have mercy on on me. Uh, uh, thank you to uh, KPI, to uh, to James, and to Dave, and obviously to Dr. Hall and Dr. Staley. Uh, I look forward to digging in even deeper to the information you presented with us. As Ben mentioned, uh, the Riverfront Legacy Master Plan uh, is is led by a number of different nonprofit but private. Uh, sector groups, who all of whom have uh, quality of place and talent as core elements of their mission. Uh, with the Greater Wichita Partnership, 
our three areas of focus relate to jobs, to talent, which is human capital in need, uh, to earlier presentations, and quality of place, and how those three, in a modern day sense, function as an integrated uh, strategy toward a broader, more holistic e uh, economic development. Uh, and so many of these organizations came together, particularly in light of Project Wichita, in light of uh, the, uh, the Mayor's Citizen Century Two Advisory uh, Committee that looked at elements of performing arts uh, in Century Two, and, and said, you know, let's take a look at this area in blue in a comprehensive way. Let's zoom out a little bit. We've done a lot of studies. We'll show you some of them uh, on certain aspects of this, or little aspects of the convention uh, business, or aspects of performing arts, or aspects of this or that. Let's zoom out a little bit, and it, as Ben said, ask the question, how can we create the most value as a community in this area? And when I say value, I don't simply mean economic value. That's certainly an element of it, but, but also together with that is cultural value. Uh, 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 civic value, a uh, gathering space value, as Dr. Staley said, those, those things are important even beyond some of the pure economic realities. So these groups came together when we talked to the city and the county and wanted to partner together in a process that uh, could help the community start to ask some of these questions. Uh, we wanted to continue on the work that had been done over the last several years, so we reached out to Populous, who had done the most recent study and, uh, and, and helped us to, to look at a master plan, which is, again, that long-range target of what could be in an area and helps to provide some trajectories, not that we're bound to in, in every sense. Uh, they have some shock absorbers you know, that we could respond to as a community as things change, but at least... Uh, to help us give a collective uh, a vision uh, going forward. And part of that team involves groups like RC Elko, who, who provided some of the economic and market uh, potential analysis, groups like Olin, who think in terms of, uh, of open spaces and gathering spaces. And we wanted to have a process where we walked through this with the community. And so we began in July, uh, where we kind of introduced the team and the process, and then continued on in September, where we hosted urban exploration tours, where we literally uh, brought folks down to the, the the area of the site and walked around. And some of the urban planners were were asking questions that urban planners ask, things like, you know, do we like the fact that buildings kind of back up to the river, or would we rather have buildings facing the river? Uh, do we notice that that our river, lucky enough, has not been so industrialized like other communities, and how might we take advantage of that? What, what, what are the concerns in terms of view corridors and densities and those types of things? Uh, how do we think about river fest and how, and, and how we can make the most sense out of that as one of our cultural icons in the community? And then in October, brought the team back again to, to present some of the market uh, 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 and, and potential demand ideas. Because, you know, we don't want to just draw pretty pictures and then ask questions down the road. Well, how do we pay for that? We need to, you know, we kind of need to ask these questions and eat our financial fruits and vegetables at the front end of the process rather than at the back end of the process. So that informs uh, the comprehensive approach. In November, based on all the community feedback we'll talk about in a second, we heard uh, or saw three root design scenarios from the, from the, uh, the design team uh, and, and heard feedback on those. And then coming up in January, January 14th, we'll talk about more uh, in just a second, uh, the design team's coming back with some kind of recommendations from their perspective about what this master plan could look like uh, in terms of uh, buildings and structures and, and giving us some renderings that could help us imagine those things. And then also talking about how we might accomplish some of those things. Uh, and, and, and over the next 10 to 15 uh, years, how might our community take steps toward this in ways that make sense, that are financially responsible, uh, that, that keep in mind the needs for talent and the continued growth in the area, uh, and, and, and ultimately giving those questions to our community to answer. Um, and so, you know, their, their role as, as design experts is to help us frame these issues up, uh, not to answer the questions for us as a community. Uh, <clears throat> When we look at the different scenarios, there are some key elements that, that comprise those uh, scenarios, or at least key elements that function like the, key, the, the ingredients. And the first is public input. Uh, and so we've heard from about 5,000 touch points from the community over the last several months. Uh, many of that open-ended, so we're able to see what people are most passionate about. And then looking at the previous studies, we need to stand on the shoulders of these studies and not try to recreate the wheel uh, every chance that we get and, and, and steward the, the resources that have already been expended in those, in those studies so we can make the most reasonable uh, uh, decisions going forward as a community. But it's also history and analysis. You know, we need to look back so that we can look forward. We need to look at what this area has meant in the past. 
uh, even perhaps before uh, Century 2 was built there in 1969, in order to empower us to look forward uh, as well. And then some core planning principles. What are the North Star commitments that guide this process and the whole, uh, the whole engagement of the, uh, of the East Bank of the Riverfront going forward? And then finally, those market realities. What would a supportable site program be? It's not just what, a, what kind of building could be built, but is there a market use for those buildings? So we're moving forward quickly here. I should note that all of these things, all of the slides that you'll see today are online. RiverfrontLegacyWichita.org, and so we're going to be moving, moving oh. quickly. Uh oh, Dr. Hall knows what, I'm, knows what I'm talking about here. We got a wild, uh, we got a wild pointer. So we talked with uh, a number of different folks throughout the community. One of these things, this is kind of shows some of the breakdown areas of public input. Uh, these two areas on the left. Uh, show the highest areas of input that we had from the community. And that revolves around uh, open spaces, green spaces, gathering spaces for the community to come together. And then also uh, accessibility to the river. What we heard from the community is that the river is not something we necessarily want to hide. We want to have more porous engagement with that. How do, we, how, do we, how do we step toward that? The area to the far right in green represents the particular conversation about Century 2, whether to renovate it or rather to replace it. And on the whole, we found that there's, a, there's kind of a split in the middle in our community about what to do with that, with, with that asset, with that building. Uh, I sense that subjectively when I talk to thousands of folks uh, through this work. Is Our community is really wrestling with these core questions of how do we... Uh, you know, maintain our traditions and, and, and honor our history and yet grow at the same time. And, and what do we do when those things might be in tension with each other? How do we have those conversations as a community? Uh, whose voice matters in that community? And so it's almost kind of a sociological experiment of Wichita trying to step together to answer some of the toughest uh, questions that we have. Ben mentioned all the previous studies. So this is kind of a data point of, of different elements of studies that have been have gone on in this site over the last several years. We want to stand on the shoulders of that. This is a property summary map, and the areas in green represent the areas where the city of Wichita owns the ground, uh, so owns the dirt, so to speak. Now, obviously, there are some areas particularly south of Waterman, where the development rights uh, have been assigned for a longer period of times, but the city still maintains ownership of these places. And so as we look at this site, it's a little bit uh, distinct from perhaps looking at a broader framework of downtown where there's much more private ownership in the area. These, this is inherently public uh, land, and, and many of the, the key uses for this land in terms of, uh, uh, of convention and performing arts are public assets too. And so how do we think about doing this in such a way, uh, you know, approaching this area in such a way that welcomes more people to the site across the entire region, across the entire socioeconomic spectrum, uh, rather than so certain elements uh, of the community? And like we said before, in order to look forward, we should look back a little bit. So this is our site in 1882 in the Griffinstein Manor. Uh, we see the north-south orientation of, uh, uh, of the city's growth. Uh, we continue forward into, I think this is the 1930s. This is not the boathouse on the site, but it's emblematic of a, uh, I think it's the Murdoch Street Bridge, of the type of density and activity that's happening there. In fact, at the very top of that boathouse, you can see there's a sign uh, that says, uh, dives from the top like five or ten cents. And, and, and while liability laws, I imagine, have changed since the 1930s, one of the things we found in this process is that the community desire to gather um, and to be together from different areas, different walks of life, remains stronger than it ever has been. Um, this is a really interesting kind of uh, map of the uh, Harlan Bartholomew report in 1922, where they began some of this master planning and imaging work. Uh, and so what we see here, just to orient you a little bit, this is the Douglas area here, the river is right here, the forum was right here, modern day century two would be about in this area here. And, and, and so it's, it's fun. One, we, one of the things we see when we kind of show this picture is that eyes light up in our community. And this idea of the city center uh, opportunity is really attractive to folks even 100 years later. Now, in 1922, we kind of know uh, with revisionist history, we can, can kind of see what happened in the years following that with the Great Depression and the war uh, and those elements and how this plan got a little derailed. Um, I'd imagine based on the 12 parking spots at the front, we would probably have had to update some of these things uh, based on uh, modern day demands, uh, but, but still the, 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 uh, the commitment exists. This is a kind of a swatch of 1980, 1882, 1938, 1970, 
1974 and 2019. And one of the things we've learned from the master planners is the emergence of kind of these super block ideas. And when we see in the 60s and 70s the emergence of the auto of automobile, the emergence of surface parking lots, uh, what that does in terms of density and connection points. Uh, and, and so at this point today in the far, in the far right, you know, in order to engage and access the river, in a lot of ways you'd have to walk around this site. Uh, and, and other than uh, Riverfest, there aren't a lot of huge gathering place draws that happen in this area. This is an interesting and creepy slide because it, it takes data from things like Fitbit and Apple Watches and Map My Run and it maps activity in our area. Uh, and this area right here shows that there's kind of some uh, a lack of activity in that northern area of our site. We talked about these planning principles. I'm going to move through these pretty quickly just by virtue of time. All of these are, all of these are online as well. Uh, but really the goal is to create a signature, distinctive, and authentic riverfront to bring everyone in the region together. And I so appreciate I think it was Dr. Saley talking about the regional realities of these things. In fact, a couple of years ago we were in McPherson talking about Project Wichita and, and, and somebody in the crowd said, you know, you got to do something about the river. And I'm racking my brain to think, is it what, what river's flowing through McPherson? And I said, help me out a little bit. What river are you talking about? He's like, I'm talking about the Arkansas River. What are we going to do about that? And I said, well, tell me how it is that you care about, about that area. And he's like, well, that's where we go to see our shows. And I don't want to live there, right? It's kind of like a Costco. You, you want to have one around. You don't necessarily want to live right next to it. And so uh, what we saw in this is a, is a, a regional uh, 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 interest. In fact, we had calls from folks that are living two or three hours away calling us to tell us what we think they should do to this area. So moving uh, quickly here, but you know, we need to think in terms of creating economic engines to support and almost endow this, these spaces so that everyone in the community can use them. Long-term sustainability, a bold vision that has an uninterrupted and sustainable uh, future for performing arts. Uh, it was a, a really clear thing. Enhance the vitality of downtown, connective thread between certain areas that are being developed Sustainable development strategies, uh, both in terms of energy and in terms of economics, uh, uh, create solutions that emphasize accessibility and walkability really in a multi-generational way. Uh, how do we think about folk? you know, I've got four kids under seven, so I'm, I'm thinking about the toddler experience here. Uh, but we also heard from dozens and dozens and dozens of people about what it looks like to create a multi-generational vision for this, this community as well. Now, I want to move through these pretty quick, but again, with the caveat that all of this is online and, and encourage you to take a look at it. Um, we've learned, we, we've kind of seen uh, residential growth continue uh, to happen uh, downtown. Uh, people are moving downtown, both in terms of adaptive reuse and in terms of new builds as well. We're also seeing that office and employment, I think Dr. Staley mentioned this earlier, the northeast area of Wichita has really grown over the past decade or 15 years, but we're also seeing an emergence of that downtown. In fact, you know, Ben is a great example of, of, of building a company headquarters downtown, uh, uh, and maybe I'll let you speak to why it is that you're doing that. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, for, first, I, I'm a millennial, uh, so we talked a little bit about my generation earlier. Uh, where I work, where uh, my future workforce wants to be is incredibly important. And so right now we're in the middle of investing millions of dollars in building a new headquarters building in Delano uh, because that's the place where I can hire the best people. Uh, I can give them an environment to work in uh, that's attractive uh, and hiring the best people is really the first key to my success. And so uh, making investments in this area makes sense from a business perspective. Um, the, I guess the, the other thing I, I'd say about millennials and Gen Z's, and we heard this earlier, is uh, they look at where they want to be first, and then they look for a job there. I mean, we've, we've heard this for over the last decade. Um, a, a change that I think I'm observing, uh, and I'm interested to hear uh, our economists take on this, but it's my belief that in the past, people followed jobs. Uh, I think it's exactly the opposite of that now. Jobs follow people. Uh, and so if Wichita can become a place that uh, we attract talented people to, the jobs will follow them. Uh, companies will seek them out where they are. So. We'll keep moving as we looked at kind of the region's uh, growth in terms of retail and hotel. Uh, one of the things we see is that our, our weekday hotel rates are higher than our weekend rates, which tells us there's some business travel happening, uh, but, but perhaps there's room for growth in terms of our leisure uh, and, and almost vacation traveling for the weekends. 
Uh, we saw uh, uh, some anticipated growth processes where we're kind of seeing some recessive activity in 2021. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, from BLS and Moody's. Um, we're also seeing, and this is one of the things we're perhaps encouraged by, is the growing uh, diversity of employment within the region. The top red line manufacturing and then the other lines that are growing uh, are, are some of those more diverse industries. Uh, and it was interesting to hear kind of Dr. Hall talk about the need for entrepreneurship and, and new businesses entering the market. And, and also Dr. Staley talking about your growth happening within your established businesses too. Uh, and, and, and one of the things that he mentioned that we need to watch out for is that over-reliance, right? And so seeing the, the growth of diversity in jobs is, is an encouraging sign for our community. And I'd, po I'd point out that construction's doubled or grown by 50%. In the last last few years, and uh, Raymond Donlinger, one of my good friends and competitors, is a big part of that too. So, good job, Raymond. So. We're not shilling for construction guys yeah, here, no, we you know, but we, we took those <laughs> those regional dynamics and then applied them to downtown, and we see some market potential in terms of residential, in terms of office, and, and then to a lower degree, uh, retail and and hotel. And then we took those same kind of uh, lenses and looked at our specific site, that 55 to 70 acre site, to say what are the market demands that exist in this particular area. And the two things that rose to the top were rental apartments, either residential uh, and, and office uh, development, supported by uh, retail. And when we say that, meaning like, you know, if you have a two or three story building, maybe the first floor being retail, second, third floor uh, being uh, office and retail. You know, Old Town is a good way to think about that, kind of how it's split up into almost like a third residential, a third commercial, a third uh, uh, um, retail, and how those things interact together and kind of create a district. Um, and so we use all that information to then develop some of these scenarios. And these are just some of the sketch pads to show just the numbers of different folks. We had, you know, 15 to 20 folks working on scenarios for our community. Um, and, and, and through that process, saw a couple of key things. One is that uh, based on what the community has, has said throughout the process, is that the site must include uh, public green space and, and not just grass, but activated, programmed, give you reasons to be there space. You know, just as an anecdotal story, in the summertime when we've got our four young kids, we're, we feed them dinner and then we try to find things to do that don't cost a lot of money. A lot of times we end up just trucking down to the keeper and letting them run around for a little bit and get scared by the music and the fire and then we get back into the car and run back home, right? It's, it's opportunities like that where, where it doesn't cost a nickel to come onto this site and to feel connected with your neighbors and to feel connected and to kind of grow that fibrous connective tissue within our, our community. The other piece is that convention center, in order to thrive, needs to be connected to an anchor hotel. And in this place, one of the existing sites is, is the Hyatt. Also, uh, performing arts cannot be interrupted, and that's uh, basically largely from the fact that our community said that. Hey, we don't want performing arts to go dark. We don't want to tackle this process in a way that uh, hampers them. Music, theater, symphony, uh, they're all too important to our community uh, from a cultural standpoint uh, to harm them. And then also a truly connected street grid to river, which allows more development. Uh, and then maximizing mixed use development to help support some of these elements of the plan rather than to detract from them. So we've got three root scenarios here and a couple of variations. Uh, we'll spend a lot, a lot of time talking about the one and three today and I'll kind of give you reasons why. We also kind of developed some key performance indexes or indicators uh, in this process to say well how do we measure these scenarios against each other? In terms of cost, in terms of benefits, in terms of uh, what they do at existing facilities or things like parking, things that the community told us that was important. Uh, and, and, uh, and from that we saw some common themes emerge, the need for creating a district, need for this area to interact well with itself. Old Town's a good example of how uh, an area can, can interact well within itself. And the other is, you know, um, so much of the passion about Century 2 is, is the iconic design. Um, and so many folks that share this idea, it's, a, it's iconic. And, and so how do we uh, continue that legacy of, of iconic design through a number of different areas? We can do it through the pedestrian bridge. We can do it through Performing Arts Center. We can do it through our green space. In fact, to the far right there is a structured green space. It's kind of a, a park that extends over uh, streets and a highway in Dallas uh, in, in ways that uh, you can both have the uglies of a highway but also the beauties of a park at the same time. And then also riverfront engagement. Uh, and so we've done some great work in our community to, to really uh, maximize the river. Uh, the, I'm talking the literal kind of sidewalk area of, of the river for accessibility. How can, we, how can we continue to grow on that? 
One of the areas, um, let's see, looks like we can't see the color here on this slide, but uh, one of the big questions in terms of existing buildings uh, for this, this plan revolve around Century 2 and, and, and the old library. Uh, both of those iconic structures, uh, both of those really important to many folks in our community. And so needed to take a look at those and to, and to take a look at what some of these previous studies have told us about them. Uh, some of the studies from, I believe, 2016 uh, talk about some of the structural um, uh, limitations of, uh, of Century 2. And, and, and in particular, uh, the weight bearing of that building is not like a normal arena where there's open weight bearing but the weight bearing happens right in the middle of the building here. And so it kind of restricted to pie slice type of use. And, and so how, how, that, how does a, a, a kind of an, a, a technical restriction like that move forward as technology and in the needs of convention and performing arts move forward as well? And so we saw, you know, in one study that uh, estimated 272 million, and that's in 2016 dollars, uh, plus about 17 million a year in terms of carrying costs to renovate uh, 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 Century Two for performing arts and, and for conventions. But what we saw in that report was that that renovation would not bring it uh, to exceed kind of industry standards. There would still be some substandard uh, uh, industry elements there. And so we have to think about, do we as a community want to make that kind of an investment where the yield might not match the investment? And we have to wrestle with that as a, as a community. We see the, the library, uh, whereas Century 2 is about 250,000 square feet, the library is about 100,000 100, square feet. And so we can kind of think in terms of different types of reuses there. Um, uh, but, but beautiful building. Uh, one of the struggles with a building like this and its brutalist style is how, do you, is it, how does it move to a modern day uh, use, uh, particularly with technologies. And we, we looked and scoured the country to say, how can you repurpose 250,000 square foot circular buildings where the core has to remain? And, and, and really kind of the closest thing that came uh, from the design team's perspective was the ferry building in, in San Francisco, but it's rectangular and it's near a, a ferry port. And so its foot traffic is much different. Uh, and so well, from the design team, uh, some of the recommendations here is that Century 2 can be renovated, but suitable, sustainable uses for a building its size are few. And while a combination of mixed-use development uh, could be considered for an adaptive reuse of the building, it's unlikely that these would gener generate developer interest in which time in the near future. So it's, you know, could you physically alter a building? Well, maybe, perhaps, with enough money you could, but is there a market use for that repurposing after the fact? We kind of have to answer both of those questions at the same time. So we look at the first scenario with just a couple of minutes, uh, about a, two minutes that we have left. Uh, the coalition met in December and, and asked the design team to come up with a final concept that really uh, focuses in on some aspects of scenario one, uh, where the, the orange uh, building there where the old library would be would be a new performing arts center. The purple uh, building there would be a, a convention center, and it's interesting, it's sunk into the ground to preserve uh, walkability and porous engagement throughout the site. And then these blue areas are mixed-use buildings, again, perhaps... Uh, 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 retail on the first floor supported by commercial and residential uh, above that and, and, and producing value for the community so that we can support things like programming on the parks uh, and, and, and some of the infrastructure upkeep. Cost here, the ranges are about in the billion dollar mark. Uh, and so when we talk about master plans, we're not talking about that as, as one pill that has to be swallowed at once. We're talking about the you know, master plan as something that could guide us as we tackle these questions for the next 10, 15, 20 years. However, our community wants to do that. We also had a scenario. To, this is uh, parking. And, and what's unique about some of these, um, that's my timer, James. See, I was keeping track of it. I, I, I knew I saw you in the corner, but I have my own timer. Um, parking was a big piece, and one of the ways we could do that is underneath some of these green spaces. And while that might be expensive, it also brings people to the site and helps to uh, create more of that dense uh, uh, green space. Uh, some more economic impact modeling that's on our website here that we talked about and, and the recommendation to uh, the design team to pursue the first scenario. Uh, and then also I wanted to show this scenario. This was a, a scenario that kept Century 2 in place uh, and, and essentially brought the Performing Arts Center uh, down south into the Waterwalk area where some of the development rights aren't 
uh, are still with Mr. DeBoer, convention center uh, in the same location, and, and fewer of the blue uh, buildings to help us support and, and, and buoy uh, the site from a public use. Uh, even that scenario is about 970 to a, to a billion uh, total. Uh, and so one of the things we wanted to uh, invite folks toward is the open house that's happening in, in January, uh, of, uh, next, or January 14th, next Tuesday, where again, as we said before, the design team is going to talk about kind of final concepts and renderings that our community can wrestle with, but also, uh, and perhaps really important to this, this crowd here, is how do we pursue that? What funding strategies uh, uh, could exist to fund that? Uh, what does an implementation plan look like? What does a phasing look like? Uh, so that we could do that in a way that makes the most sense. With that, James, I will turn it back to you. Uh, I'll take the easy questions. Ben can take the hard ones. Right on. so, okay, just a quick recap of the ground rules as I see hands going up. I'm holding the mic. Uh, quick questions. The point is to try to get as many people engaged in the conversation as we can. So have your question ready. Be succinct. Be pithy. Uh, ask a question. No follow-ups. No that kind of stuff. And then we'll try to get as many people as we can here. There's a question over here. We'll start up in the front. I would like to know how we're going to keep the city out of the real estate business. Because historically, they're not very good at it. <clears throat> It's a great question. I think one of the benefits that a master plan could provide a community <laughs> is that it provides some element of direction, uh, some element of, uh, of, of clarity moving forward. As we said earlier, obviously not written in granite, obviously not something that's unresponsive to different trends in the market, but at least uh, provides a target that the whole community can shoot at uh, and, and, and make sense that way. And, and, and probably there's a restrictive element to that too, where if things don't make sense um, and are outside of some of that master planning logic, uh, then those things would not perhaps gather as much uh, uh, support. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I'd agree. I mean, I think it provides us as a community a tool to hold our city and county leaders accountable. So right, if, if we say as a, as a group and then ultimately as a community in some sort of way to ratify this, that this is what we want, uh, and then they deviate from that, then we have a, a definite clear picture to point to to say, what about this? So, cool. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Right back here, guys. It, it seems to me that we have a paradigm set that the city and downtown is all north of Kellogg. And would it, to maybe my question is, tell me where I'm wrong, but would an investment you're talking about in, in replacing that whole Century 2 library area with something else, might that same money south of Kellogg but close add to the perception of a larger city, a more successful city? And, and Century 2 do, does what it does. I mean, I'm, I attend a lot of the cultural theater events there. Mm -hmm. They're not all sold out now. We don't need a larger room necessarily for the music theater of Wichita to do what it does very well. So can Century 2 not operate as its own economic unit? Perhaps we get a perception of a larger city if we look south of Kellogg a little? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think. I think to your question about you know size and scope, I think it's really important that we right size these things, right? And and if we talk about conventions, don't need to be talking about trying to be Vegas, right? Or you know we need to say what works for our community and how do we do that in an authentic way. As to your questions about the South in terms of the city's kind of strategy, I won't, I won't speak for the city with that, but but one of the hopes with a master plan like this is when we talk about a connected street grid. Uh, not necessarily only talking about the grid streets within the blue area, but how those might then spur uh, development around that area too. And so as we think about, take Broadway for example, uh, and, and these are great conversations we had with uh, Council Member Clendenin and his, his, uh, his constituents at a, uh, a district breakfast a couple of months ago, you know, and it really heard different points of view about how that kind of growth uh, could, could then expand into these different areas. Uh, and, and so eager to have those types of conversations, especially as it relates to the south, uh, south, southern end of, uh, of the community. Okay, hands high for questions. If you've already asked one, uh, I will be honest, you are at the bottom of the screen. Uh, just so that we can try to get more people. It doesn't mean that we won't get to you, but 
Uh, so I've got one, two, raise them high, and I'm I'll turn them around. Um, keep them high so I can kind of get a lay of the land and move around a little bit. Okay. Right. <laughs> trying to weed people out with their, you know, their arms getting tired, I guess, huh? Yes, uh, you don't have to keep it up. Just okay. Right. <laughs> yes, guys, I had a question uh, about planning. What about the plan for the water uh, project that we need uh, severely? Where's that in relationship? I, I think we need to do that before we even think about this plan. Uh, where's that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's that's, you know, because clarity in this area is not the only need that our community faces, right? I mean, there are a number of different things that are, that are factoring together. I think that's why it's important for us to have maintain a good partnership with the city uh, as, as the, the entity that's leading that process and that project to understand uh, where are we in terms of securing funding for that? And what does that, uh, what does that timeline look like? And I think they're probably the best uh, source of information for that. All right, right over here we have a question. Just real quick, quickly, since uh, Century 2 is currently in our performing arts center, but most every agency has some shortcomings, right. the, will the new performing arts center be built before anything is done in Century 2? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, kind of goes back to that core commitment that, you know, throughout this process, we can't move forward with a plan that would put uh, performing arts uh, in the dark. Uh, and so when we talk about implementation and phasing, um, you know, there's, there's a significant aspect of that that says, well, how do we, you know, pursue some of these different uh, public assets in a way uh, that preserves uh, performing arts health throughout the process? You know, in talking with Wayne Bryant and, and, and supporters of the arts, it doesn't make a lot of sense for our community to invest heavily in a performing arts center if the way that we do that really injures some of our key performing arts agencies. Uh, that wouldn't make a lot of sense for us. And so, yeah, I think uh, one of the core tenets about uh, the phasing and the implementation timeline would be uh, perhaps you would build a new performing arts center before anything ever would happen with Century 2 if our community wanted to go that direction. All right, uh, hands up again if you've got a question. I think I've got a general lay of the land. Hi, no <coughs> Okay. Evan, uh, I went to a lot of meetings and, and, and consistently there were citizens there who were asking you if you have a public vote on this. I, I think that's real important to a lot of people. We have been watching downtown development for a long time uh, and a lot of the projects have not, not been stellar. Uh, people would like to vote on the library, on the ball sports complex, that, and now we have an opportunity. The scenarios that you're talking about here that are going to accept Century 2 and the library gets torn down. Why are you doing this without a public vote? It's a great question, John, and I appreciate your attendance at the meetings, too, throughout the process. I think, you know, one of the things that's been really encouraging uh, throughout the process is that, you know, this is not something that where we have to try to garner uh, energy in our community, right? Like, hey, this is an important thing. We should all care about this issue. Uh, that energy exists today, and, and that's good. That kind of vibrancy is really helpful for our community. To your particular question, uh, about a public vote, uh, you know, what our goal is today is to offer a vision of what this area could be. Obviously, the community at some point needs to weigh in on this, uh, whether it be through the funding mechanisms or if there's a different uh, way to weigh in on it. And, and in that respect, to defer to city, to county, and those types of legal processes. What we're trying to do if through this process is to hear from the community what's important to them. How do we, uh, uh, how, how do we develop a vision, a mature vision, that's supported by uh, economic realities, that's supported by uh, uh, the need to engage the question of talent, supported by by uh, urban uh, planning principles in, in such a way that our community can, if they don't want to do anything in this area, can make that known, right? And if they do, uh, that there's a mature vision of, a, of at least a, a trajectory that we could pursue. Okay, uh, for everybody else who still have their hands up, a bunch more shot up after that last question, so I'm going to beg of you be brief in how you ask your question. Okay. Um, good afternoon or evening. Okay, I would like to know you know, you're wanting to bring business to the city. Can you bring some of the businesses that have left the city 
limits into the city again, like for example, workforce. I cannot believe you they took it and moved it to a place where it's hard to get transportation, it's not main, I mean, there's not very many food places to eat there, I mean, there's some, but still. You know, you would be bringing new people that are trying to apply for jobs there into the city. Is there any way you can get back workforce place there? And second, what about the busing? If you want people to be there, I have a nephew that had to work. Monday, I think some of the people didn't go back to work. He uses the bus system. He has mentally challenged us, mm -hmm. okay? Guess what? We had to pick him up to take him to work. No bus system, now come on. You know, and I've met several people from out of town moving in here and they're saying, where's the bus system? So yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it, great comments. Um, and, and to your first comment relative to kind of maybe core density versus, you know, regional growth as well. I think one of the things that at the Greater Wichita Partnership that we try to do, and this is to Dr. Hall's point earlier, is really look at our 10 county area and want to see growth in all of those areas. Uh, and, and yet at the same time, understanding that there are certain benefits that come with density uh, in downtown area too. So with regard to the specific issue uh, that you mentioned, are you talking about the Workforce Development Center? Yeah, I don't have a specific comment or, or knowledge on that. We can chat afterwards, but I, I don't have a, a specific position on that. In terms of busing, you know, I think uh, transportation is a huge piece of this. Uh, one of the slides that we cut was this idea of complete streets and how we think about migration within these sites in our core downtown uh, that envisions things like uh, handicapped and multi-generational access, uh, parking, uh, uh, bikeability, walkability, those types of things. All right, another yes, question right here. Um, in your, all your surveys and all your public touch points and everything like that, are they ever broken up by like generational opinion or by like people who work downtown's opinion or people who live downtown's opinion? Is that ever? I never seen that up on a presentation. I'm just curious. How yeah, that. that's a great question. Um, not relative to the riverfront work we do uh, with regard to Project Wichita. Uh, and, and that's where we saw that the number one issue uh, was creating opportunities to keep and retain college graduates in our community. And so when we looked at uh, some of the uh, cultural attractions, uh, downtown riverfront, those types of engagement, so what we saw was, was a really high uh, support level for younger folks in those communities. And we actually saw um, uh, high support numbers from our minority communities uh, there as well. So it's really interesting data. It's broken out uh, in many ways by demographics, and it's at projectwichita.org for more uh, information. I guess one, one thing I'd add really quickly on that is when we put the coalition together, we thought really carefully about that, and one of the members that we asked to join that was actually W, which is the young professionals group from the chamber, because we, we think their voice is incredibly important as we consider the future of really what will be their city. Uh, and so we've been very specific about including W and, and Daryl, uh, their leaders here this evening. And so if you have questions for him, make sure you head up Daryl. Good. I make no promise that we get to everybody. There's a lot of questions left. But one last call for hands. Raise them high and I will do my level best. One, two, three, four, five. You're going to get killing me. Uh, six, seven, eight. Okay. <laughs> so I'm a transplant uh, talent from the West Coast to Wichita. The near six years, I think Wichita has a lot better story to tell when it's allowed to tell it. I'm pretty excited to live here, stay here. And uh, I'd like to start a business here at some point in time, so uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to fail at that. So I might need to start another one. You talk. <laughs> Statistics will tell you you're right. Music to your ears, Dr. Staley, wherever you are. <laughs> My question is simply, how do you guys think about optionality? Not necessarily how does your plan show optionality, but how do you think about building optionality into the space for future generations of failures? Yeah, let me ask you to expand, you know, talk a little bit about what you mean by optionality. I mean, I can, I can guess, but unpack that for me a little bit. James, you mind if he clarifies his question just a little bit? Sure. So I think we're going to have to attract talent today. We're going to have to attract talent in the future. We're going to have to attract different businesses that yeah. have talent that works at Hudson yeah. or anywhere yeah. else. My failing companies are going to be interested in different places where they're going to want to go on their lunch break. You know, yeah. How, yeah. how do we think about that? I think that's the public venues, one of the public venues uh, features. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's 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 a good question. Ben, do you have anything to speak to? Uh, sure. No, I, I totally agree with you. We have to have flexibility in any of the plans that we have. Uh, and that's actually one of the challenges with what we have now, that there's very little flexibility in how Century 2 and, and the site around it can be used. Uh, and that's why you see Riverfest is really the only major community event that happens on the lawn around Century 2. Uh, so we believe that uh, in Scenario 1A or 1B, we find much more flexibility in how to use all of the spaces that are built there. And we can also create density, uh, which brings more people to use those spaces on a regular basis. Uh, not necessarily just for the paid events when they're going to music theater or uh, the opera. Right, and I would just say we did have uh, time to look through uh, all of the scenarios in detail, but they are in your slides. Again, they will be in and the on, policy.org yeah. uh, as well in these slides, and I'm sure you can find them at the different Greater Wichita Partnership uh, web portals as well. Another question right up here in front. You mentioned Wayne Bryan with Music Theater. He went on a local radio show recently and said he could probably raise two-thirds of the money that he needed from his patrons. And I can't bear the thought of a disproportionate sales tax funding this thing. So I'm curious how we will pay for it. Jennifer, it's a great question, good, good comment. Uh, I, I think when we look at something like this, particularly in its size and in its scope, uh, uh, we, we've got to evaluate different types of funding mechanisms, both public and private, right? And so uh, particularly things like performing arts. Uh, I think we've seen across the country uh, the private support of those areas are really important, and we've seen thriving you know, performing arts centers uh, with pub private support. So that's a big piece of that. I think one of the things that we'll, we'll hear from uh, the design team as we see next week is some of those options of, of what other, what can we learn from other communities in terms of how we fund it? What works for Wichita, right? Because a story from another community is helpful for us to, to read and understand, but we got to write our own uh, uh, story as well. So uh, I, I think next week we'll begin that conversation of how might we fund something like this over a long period of time uh, and, and, and how would the community want to pursue that? Okay, we have got five hands left that I saw, maybe six. Uh, we're not going to get to everybody, so forgive me. But the only way this works is if the people who do have their hands up ask a quick question. That is a sentence, not a paragraph. Okay? So. I was wondering why we're expected to walk distances to get to the ballpark, but we can't walk a little ways to the river. Yeah. yeah. And, and are you talking about parking? Or are you talking about our comments about super blocks and kind of walking around? Help me understand your comments a little bit better. Well, the parking for the ballpark is going to be blocks away. And, you know, people walk to the river now, and it's not that far. Sure, yeah. One of the things I've learned uh, in talking to a lot of community members about this process is that people have... Uh, deep passions about parking, uh, and 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 That's a very kind way to say that. And certain no. folks will tell you. That's why he answers. The you question. know, you could stand to walk a walk a couple of blocks, and other folks say, you know, hey, we need parking right here too, and so. Uh, you, you know, that's a complex issue, um, and, and certainly as somebody with young kiddos, I think about like how far we'd have to walk in terms of number of meltdowns until we get to our, you know, destination. And we also need to think to your comment too about this multi-generational use and, and, and understanding that uh, we want to have a real diverse uh, uh, subset of our community in these places and folks that have different levels of, of, of walkability and, and, and those types of things. And so, uh, you know, I think it, what we've tried to commit to do is to replace and then some, some of the parking that exists on the site. Okay, uh, if I could also humbly ask the audience to keep these side conversations to a minimum so that we can hear that would be wonderful as well. I just would like to know uh, how you're going to find something of the performing arts that are is that that iconic as Century 2 is. You don't see that on every sh street in any town, but here. Yeah. Yeah. You, you won't hear me disagree with you on the iconic imagery of, of, of Century 2. You know, I'm a Wichita kid, grew up here, marks the skyline here. But as we said before, too, you know, it's, it's an interesting point for our community to wrestle with. Uh, knowing some of the limitations and knowing some of the, the, the issues that exist with the building, how do we honor that past and how do we honor that skyline and yet grow at the same time? I think 
uh, I completely understand your point. All right, next question right here. Yes, um, one of the problems seems to be getting people downtown. Why do we have these huge buses and we see two or three or four people on them? Why can't if they come once an hour? Wouldn't it be better to have smaller buses that come every 15 minutes? Sure, and, and I'd, I'd defer to the city on, on those types of transportation issues. Uh, uh, that's that's not necessarily my bailiwick, so. All right, you bet. Right here. I heard a much lower estimate on remodeling Century 2 without all the frills the city threw in there. Maybe, uh, I don't know, I'll just throw out a number, under 100 million, 75, versus half a billion for a new one. Uh, the world looks to, Broadway looks to, Music Theater Wichita for their talent. The talent there wants to perform here. The symphony performs two shows every year for over 12,000 high schoolers. Uh, we have a successful fine arts program. Somehow it's managed to survive in Century 2. If it ain't busted, why, fi why not fix it? So I'd agree with you up until your last comment. I think it's been broken for a number of years and we've had study after study tell us that Century 2 does not live up to the cap caliber of performing arts um, capabilities that our community has. Um, if you look at the challenges of remodeling Century 2 to continue to be a performing arts facility, um, the costs are incredibly large. If you really want to have a world-class performing arts facility, which if I'm going to invest my tax dollars in a project like that, I would expect it to be excellent. Uh, doing that at Century 2 is very expensive because of some of the structural issues uh, that Evan mentioned earlier. But even more than that, a remodel of that scope and caliber will make our performing arts facility go dark for a year at least, maybe two seasons for Music Theater Wichita and the Symphony. And so that's why that's actually not a viable scenario for uh, me and the dollars that I would invest in it. All right, we've got two more questions yeah, at this table, it. and then we will be done quickly. Sir. Having grown up in this town and doing high school without either the form or century two, I think it was very um, divisive for the community. In other words, we didn't have a, a core, and I think that having gone to New York City in 68 and seen a brand new um, Madison Square Garden, which still exists, uh, they're not building a new one. I would say that we can't tear down ours until we build a new one because that would be probably be more harmful than not doing anything. Yeah, yeah. I think we, we, we agree. agree with that yeah. fundamentally. Okay, last question, sir, right here. What guarantees do you have that you can give to us with your coordination, one, for mental health, because I go down to the Riverwalk and there's stuff everywhere. We don't bring our family down there. That's why you don't get dollars down in that area. And number two, the consent of the government, the millennials who want this, right, what guarantee do you have that they're gonna stay here versus spend everybody's taxpayer dollars and then go off with the digital nomadacy to another job somewhere else? Because right now, this doesn't look like a, an upside for us. Uh, I'll take this. Nomad. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one and Evan will clean up my answer because I'll be incredibly <laughs> direct. There are no guarantees. Uh, but what we can do as a community is try our best on both of those things. Uh, and if we choose to do nothing on either, then where are we going to be at? Uh, as, as I look at this plan, first on the mental health and, and the challenges that our community has on that, I agree it's a huge issue. Uh, I see it in our business, I see it in Delano where I'm building a new facility, but I also believe it's investments like these that bring people to areas uh, that can help other people. Uh, and so I think this is a positive direction for mental health in our community. To your second question on digital nomads, uh, you're right. Um, millennials now and even more uh, Gen uh, Z uh, in the future will choose where they want to live. Um, if we don't make Wichita a place where they choose to want to live, then we all will lose. Um, and this project is, uh, like one of the former speakers said, this is a quality of life project. We can talk about it in economic 
uh, terms. We can talk about return on investment, and all of that is important, and we need to be careful with that. Uh, but this project and others like it are signals to our community and signals to the future workforce of Wichita that we believe in our city and we want them to be here. Uh, if we choose to say no to that, uh, then we are signaling to them just the opposite. Right. Okay, Evan, you can fix that if you want. <laughs>